Hello, everyone. Privileged to have Professor Manu Shankar Hari with us. He's a co-author of Surviving Sepsis Guidelines and Sepsis 3.0 Definition. His research focuses on adult critically ill patients with sepsis. In particular, epidemiology, recovery of immune function. Currently, he holds the chair of Translational Critical Care Medicine at the Institute of Regeneration and Repair, the University of Edinburgh. Manu's research goal is to enable precision immunomodulation in critically ill patients with sepsis and ARDS. We welcome you, sir. A privilege to have Professor Manu Shankar Hari. So I'll start with my first question. With introduction of sepsis 3.0, the QSOFA has replaced SIRS uh, criteria as a tool for stratification. But its clinical utility and accuracy has been the subject of debate, as QSOFA has not been thoroughly validated. Now, considering the ongoing controversy over the effectiveness of QSOFA compared to SIRS, what are the next steps in sepsis diagnosis? What are the tools or strategies that might be developed to enhance the accuracy in early detection of sepsis? Yeah, so uh, thanks again for hosting me. This is a, a great question. So we we did write about uh, QSOFA um, with a, an editorial in Annals of Internal Medicine side, QSOFA, Q Confusion, uh, because it, the points you raise exactly is the challenge. Even in the original manuscript, we make a specific point. Failure to meet a QSOFA of two or more should not lead to a deferral of investigation for infection or treatment because that a clinicians may feel that infection is a reason for patient being unwell. QSOFA was, um, if you look at the original manuscript, QSOFA timestamps are, if you take a blood sample for a suspected infection, what are the physiological abnormalities at that time that predict deterioration later? So that's what QSOFA did. QSOFA was not there to say, it has to replace us. QSOFA was a tool to say, if you have these abnormalities, it is likely that you will deteriorate. You've got a greater likelihood of deterioration if you had two or more elements of QSOFA. And unlike SIRS, it, it does not need any blood test. For example, SIRS needs white blood cell count, whereas QSOFA does not need that. It just is confusion, which is, which is GCS score, respiratory rate uh, of 22 breaths per minute or more, and a altered mental state of GCS and the blood pressure. So those are the three variables in the QSOFA score. And when you, to come to your question, which is what are the things in diagnostic, when you think about a test or a tool for a patient's illness, as a clinician at least, uh, me as a clinician looks for a few things really. Is the test going to tell me uh, something about screening? Screening is where you want to determine a preclinical disease, as in before they become sepsis, you want to figure out whether they are likely to develop sepsis. That's your screening tool. And I think QSOFA and SIRS both have got uh, values for that elements of screening. But what QSOFA is derived from symptomatic patients. Remember when I said somebody, a clinician or a healthcare professional, felt that this person has got an infection as the likely reason for their acute illness. So. The starting point of QSOFA is already symptomatic disease. Therefore, you're not really using it as a screening tool. The second thing you want is, I want to diagnose sepsis. If that's your question, the diagnosis of sepsis requires organ dysfunction. And QSOFA, an altered GCS, gives you neurological dysfunction. A low blood pressure gives you cardiovascular dysfunction. So in a way, in terms of sepsis diagnostic, you are closer to the eventual diagnosis of sepsis if you believe that infection is the reason why they are acutely unwell. So that's a kind of the diagnostic element. And you can contrast that diagnostic element with kind of SIRS and you can see why QSOFA pe performs better for that particular question. The third question you want is, is this person likely to get a severe disease? Now, the severe disease uh, for clinicians is is this person going to require organ dysfunction, ICU stay, or have a greater risk of dying than somebody who does not have a positive test? And I think QSOFA performs there because what you're saying is if you have QSOFA, you've got a greater risk of staying in hospital, greater risk of needing critical care, greater risk of organ dysfunction. So in a way, the severity scoring element is useful. The, then the other reason why you would use a test is 
is this the clinical decision rule? So what you're doing there is going to the end of the bed and then you as a clinician feel that this person has got a suspected disease that looks like sepsis or looks like an infection. And there you want to answer the question, should I just treat with antibiotics and leave them where they are? Or should I treat with antibiotics and take them to a setting where their deterioration can be managed? And I think there are different elements of that one question, which is what is this patient's illness brings in, which is the, the things that I said are screening, diagnosis, severity scoring and clinical decision. These are things that we as doctors look for. Then the last thing you probably will need to think about is prognosis, right? I mean, and response to a treatment that you're giving. Uh, the cues of a kind of was not actually uh, performed, uh, derived for any response to treatment prediction, neither is SERS. But what QSOFA does give you is prognostic value. If you got a two or more variables of QSOFA, you got a worse prognosis than somebody who does not have that value. So I think it's a total confusion as to what QSOFA is and should be used for. And I think part of the reason why this happens is that people conflate QSOFA as a replacement for SERS and QSOFA as an early warning score. And often the other argument that you hear is, hey, new score is better than QSOFA because, and actually it's a simple uh, basic epidemiology, right? If you have a scoring system that has got five variables compared to scoring system that's got three variables, the five variable scoring system will perform better. I mean, that's just basic math. So it's totally um, confusing as to why uh, people think QSOFA can do more than what it's originally intended to do. In very simple terms, QSOFA was there because you wanted a, a quick, end of bed end of bedogram uh, to say if you are suspecting an infection as the reason for their acute illness and they have two or more variables of QSOFA they are likely to have a greater risk of adverse outcome and that adverse outcome is hospital length of stay IC length of stay or mortality does that answer your question that you asked yes definitely okay, cool okay professor uh... Manishankar, Manishankar Hari, it's a honor again to have you in the ISCCM podcast. Yep. Our next question, you know, the disease like sepsis and ARDS, especially sepsis, the heterogeneity is always an issue with the, with the subjects involved. You know, especially when we, we are talking about the subtyping, the phenotyping of the, of the, of the uh, subjects which have the diagnosis and uh, with regards to the precision treatment or uh, personalized treatment for any disease, especially for the sepsis, because uh, subtypes can share certain uh, biology and it can affect outcome also. So we would like to listen from you. How clinically relevant are those phenotypes, especially with regards to improvement in diagnosis, treatment and prognosis in sepsis? And that question is followed by, what impact might these subtypes help us in tailoring our treatment to uh, better outcome? Yeah, so, uh, heterogeneity essentially means that um, you have a variation either in the risk of developing a disease or risk of having an outcome from the disease or risk of response to treatment with the disease. So that's essentially the basic premise of heterogeneity and heterogeneity is not unique uh, to sepsis and critical illness it is there everywhere it is there in myocardial infarction it is there in COPD it's there in asthma that is fundamentally because of the fact that we all have evolved dealing with different environmental challenges so therefore uh, the way our body responds to infection or any form of illness would be uh, different so that's the kind of the starting point for this notion of uh, heterogeneity then comes the point about how does uh, subtyping help and as you rightly point out uh, the heterogeneity essentially means that whenever we do an idea of looking for a biomarker or a subtype of sepsis 
depending upon the type of test you do or the measurements you do, you will have different phenotypes or subtypes. What do I mean by that? So if you think about, um, let's let's take for an argument's sake, uh, you are going to take a clinical definition of a heterogeneity. And here, if you just take a blood sample, uh, not a blood sample, just purely uh, clinical data, um, then what you would essentially have is patients with variation in a particular organ system, like a blood pressure or a liver disease or a renal disease, and patients who are young and old, patients who are male and female, patients who got respiratory disease or non-respiratory disease, patients who got other illnesses. In other words, uh, you, your subpopulation de de is determined by the nature of the data that goes in. The second uh, feature of uh, the terminology that is important here is a phenotype merely represents a cluster of visible properties in an organism. It does not mean anything more. Now, when we when people talk about subphenotype, they immediately think that you kind of understood the biology. No, we haven't. And it is fairly obvious when you th think about some of the subphenotypes of sepsis uh, reported in the literature. Um, for example, um, there are sepsis subphenotypes purely based on clinical data. And here there is no understanding of underpinning mechanism. Then there are subphenotypes based on transcriptomic data. And what you get there um, with the transcript based subphenotyping is purely a two dimensional reduction of variation in 36,000 parameters that you've studied. That's a very crude way of stating what you're seeing there. You get two, three, four, whatever, depending upon the number of uh, rules that you set and what variation you're looking for. So even, even within those subphenotypes, you only have a relative mechanism, as in subphenotype X has a different mechanism compared to subphenotype Y. There is nothing that is out there in the literature that says, Subphenotype X has got a unique sepsis specific mechanism. And I think that is an important point to think about when you don't have a good enough control um, to identify the subphenotype. So, to kind of instead of making this even longer, I'll just stop there so that you can ask other questions around it. What we currently have is a complete lack of true analysis of longitudinal multi domain biological data to call a subphenotype of sepsis based on mechanism. What we do have is a lot of subtypes of sepsis based on either clinical parameters or one or more biological parameters that actually provide very little information on how to treat them. I think that is the fundamental problem we have. I would essentially say subtyping field is just starting to take shape and anybody who thinks that they have found a subtype to treat uh, using the basic premise of precision medicine is actually not saying the complete truth. Very well said, and we agree with that particular point you raised very clearly regarding the heterogeneity and uh, phenotyping in sepsis. Thank you. We will go to the next question. This is um, regarding the next uh, hot topic or controversial topic regarding immunomodulation. So. How does immunomodulation influence the progression and treatment of sepsis? So, you know, uh, you can understand the mechanism contribute to the development of targeted therapies. Thus, yeah. uh, this particular uh, term and way of treatment uh, is, uh, is is something which you can consider. Yeah. So, great question. And I think um, I want to kind of, I don't, I don't want to be too negative about all the things that we have, we're going to talk about. So, so immunomodulation, uh, very simply put, essentially means that you're going to give a drug that changes the way the ongoing immune response is in that patient. So the, so the basic way of thinking about it, which is what we have done thus far, is to say there is excess inflammation and or there is excess immunosuppression. And you can manage excess inflammation with anti-inflammatory drugs and immunosuppression with immunostimulant drugs. What we don't say is the next sentence. So I'm going to rephrase that sentence. We can manage excess inflammation with anti-inflammatory drugs if the causal path to bad outcome is that excess inflammation. 
I'm going to do the second thing, which is immunosuppression. We can treat immunosuppression with immunostimulatory drugs if we know that the causal path to immunosuppression, to death, is immunosuppression. And I think the reason why I say that is twofold. I'm going to make two simple points. I'm just going to use the example of hyperinflammation uh, and uh, treatment with an anti-inflammatory drug. So if you were to give an anti-inflammatory drug to a patient with hyperinflammation, we know that patients respond to treatment differently. In other words, there is variation in treatment response. Some patients, when you give this treatment, based on systemic blood levels of excess inflammation, which is what we all t look for, like CRP or IL-6 or whatever else that you think you want to believe is the reason for hyperinflammation, ferritin. You give a drug and your basic premise is that you're tackling hyperinflammation. But the other side of the coin is that patients could be, could go on to die because they are now excessively immunosuppressed. We are never titrating anti-inflammatory drugs. We're just giving a fixed dose at one time point or two time points and that's that. So they can't, they have a risk of immunosuppression. And often this is done on blood levels of a biomarker. A re, a, a, another reason why we haven't seen any success is to say you take a blood test and there is hyperinflammation in the blood. But at the same time, if you were to take an imaginary bronchoalveolar lavage sample and you look for the same biomarker, that biomarker may be very low. And by definition, if you say the biomarker is low and that is not hyperinflammation, the lung may be in a different immune state compared to the blood. In other words, the inflammation in sepsis has now become compartmentalized and the compartments are different. So you then treat them with an anti-inflammatory drug based on the blood level of biomarker. What you essentially now have is a more immunosuppressed lung state, which causes a secondary infection. And therefore, you don't improve the outcome, you sometimes worsen the outcome. And we can make a similar argument for uh, immunosuppression as well. So currently, we don't know enough about how best to immunomodulate patients with sepsis. So that's the first fundamental kind of building block to the uh, discussion. The second building block to the uh, discussion here is which of the inflammatory responses are bad for you? So if you were to take a panel of cytokines in a patient with sepsis, they may have raised IL-6, they may have raised IL-8, and they will have low HLA-DR, they will have raised IL-10. And if you were to pick and choose an inhibitor for one of these drugs, uh, you will choose an IL-6 blocker because that is where most of the data is, or you will choose an immunostimulant like GMCSF, which is where the HLA-DR suppression, immunosuppression due to HLA-DR expression is. And you give one or, one or both of these drugs and essentially look for an improvement in outcome. And what you then have forgotten is that by blocking one pathway, you've, you've essentially taken out the another basic immunological concept, which is that Immune responses don't happen in isolation. They are interlinked pathways. When you suppress one of the pathways, there is so much redundancies between pathways that something else get activated and then causes the outcome that you wanted to prevent. So we are not yet, yet at a stage where we can really understand how to precisely immunomodulate a sepsis patient. Then you come to the point, is there anything that actually makes any bit of difference? And I think the only bit of uh, thing that I can probably think about, which is again, slightly controversial, is uh, the role of hydrocortisone, low dose hydrocortisone in the context of documented septic shock, uh, with or without fludrocortisone. And hydrocortisone is a cheap drug. It is available everywhere. It is a fixed dose. The side effects are well understood at that dose in a critically ill patient, which is hyperglycemia, risk of secondary infection, uh, bleeding. Those are the three broad risks. Those things are targetable, preventable, treatable. And it is cheaper tips. And that has been consistently shown to shorten the duration of needing for vasopressor therapy. The impact of mortality may be slightly more uncertain. So in a way, if you're a critical care doctor and you've got somebody in front of you and they are in shock, and you want to give them an, an immunomodulator, the cheap and cheerful uh, immunomodulator to give is 200 milligram hydrocortisone 
or equivalent doses over a 24 hour window up to 7 to 10 days. Um, and the final point I want to say before I stop here is you can go down the depths of immunology and figure out much more uh, complex way of looking at this. And um, one complex way of looking at it is to think about what are referred to in rheumatoid arthritis in particular uh, and other immune mediated inflammatory diseases uh, what are referred to as signature cytokine uh, concepts for the disease. So in rheumatoid arthritis the signature uh, cytokine is IL-6 um, and the second element of the rheumatoid arthritis uh, uh, paradigm is the use of um, high levels of efficacy with something like uh, something much more broader than a single cytokine like uh, targeting a pathway which is the J J JAK-STAT inhibition which is Janus kinase pathway using baricetinib where you are trying to block more than just one pathway and I think uh, in in sepsis uh, in particular if you are looking for a signal based on basic signs um, and Mendelian randomization studies, you would think about IL-6 where it has got probably the maximum uh, value as an empiric uh, thing to test. It is not to treat, it's to test. Hope I've answered the question that you're asking. Perfectly. I think uh, there's a balanced uh, answer covering uh, both the experts very clearly and with the definite recommendation. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thank, thanks for giving us clarity on immunomodulation, which has always been a controversial topic when you're dealing with management of sepsis. So now coming to everybody's favorite topic, uh, artificial intelligence. So how can artificial, in artificial intelligence be lever leveraged to analyze and predict the long-term mortality risk among uh, sepsis survivors uh, based on patient characteristics and uh, specific uh, factors observed during initial critical care admission? Right. So I'm not an AI expert. I'm going to kind of say that the only uh, claim I can make is I did a master's in epidemiology at the London School. So that's the only bit of uh, thing that I'll claim as uh, the reason why I can say something about AI. So um, the your question is, can you use AI to predict long term risk? So um, any prediction tool uh, requires an independent association between that variable and the outcome in question. And I'm going to talk about one tool that uh, I was involved in developing, which is based on, it, it doesn't, didn't use any artificial intelligence. Um, it just used normal intelligence and uh, um, regression model. So uh, what that tool is, is it asks the question, can we use sepsis characteristics of patients when they come into ICU to predict what happens to them longer term? So what we did was to do a regression model. And using that regression model, we said uh, we can derive a prognostic score that tells you the risk of developing a longer term outcome like rehospitalization or death by one year. So now coming to the AI question. Most of the uh, under the bonnet AI activity or machine learning activity is to look for association between the exposure and the outcome and often involves multi-level modeling of some description um, to come up with a score or a um, prompt or a nudge or a trigger or whatever it is. So I think majority of the outcome exposure relationship is predictable based on the data that we have using simple regression models. What AI can probably do is to make that automation, probably make that validation of the data quicker and make the recalibration of the data for different uh, geographic areas or different variables quicker. I mean, that's the best I could answer because I, I'm not an AI expert and uh, I don't want to kind of say things that I'm not an expert in. But that's the best I could do. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Manishankar Hari. Uh, if you could uh, ask me, how will I conclude your uh, broadcast? Our broadcast is that uh, the questions have been answered in a way from a scientist level to the clinician levels. That is what the viewers and listeners would love to hear. So once again, um, uh, it's a real honor to have you here. And thank you so much uh, for uh, joining us.
No, thank now, you so much for having me. Yeah. yeah. Before I conclude, uh, let me ask you one more open question. So, yes. what as an expert in um, the field would you like to share uh, with your listeners, especially with regards to the work, the research work you are doing right now with uh, vaccines for immune recovery following sepsis? I think, to me, it feels like, uh, at least intellectually, I feel uh, that we are still trying to cling on to um, slightly outdated ideas and eminence-based medicine. I feel like there is an opportunity with the advances in molecular biology, genetics, the computational points that you guys highlight. The goal of all of us should be to kind of probably work together uh, with very different specialities coming together to actually produce something much more unique for sepsis. I think that is what we try to do uh, with that um, Lancet Respiratory Medicine paper on uh, immunomodulation because we felt like we're just talking to critical care folk and we're not talking to people outside. That's one. And the second uh, thing that I want to say about the sepsis survivor uh, question that you uh, specifically kind of highlight, I, I, to me, currently what we are doing for uh, sepsis survivors is totally disjointed. Um, we haven't we know that sepsis survivors have got broadly few domains of disability or ill health which is they've got physical and functional disability they've got cognitive and mental impairment they've got kind of impairment in things like uh, swallow and their comorbid conditions are thought to worsen and they've got a risk of adverse long-term outcome and if you're really thinking about the what a patient is actually looking at you for a doctor they're not looking for fancy new things they want to understand can you do anything for the new functional limitations that i have can you do anything for my cognitive impairment like one in three sepsis survivors have anxiety depression or post-traumatic stress disorder they are asking us can you actually follow me up and do something specific for that problem rather than giving me kind of things like fancy treatments. They are asking us, often sepsis survivors who have adverse outcomes come from poorer background. And they are asking us, actually, when I actually have a long-term problem, I am unable to actually go and look for solutions because my income that I get I'm going to use to eat food or look after my family rather than going to look after myself by going to a clinic or giving the doctor some money to make me better. And I think the disparities are so much. It's not just a lower and middle income country problem. It is a problem across the globe. We just aren't really saying there is a King's Fund report in, that highlights the same problem in a different context in England. There's a WHO report that highlights just disparities. When you survive a critical illness, you lose your income more or less overnight if you're a young person or you get so frail that your activities of daily living are gone and your cognitive function is impaired. I mean, if you are really asked, you know, trying to do something to help sepsis survivors, those are the things that we need to focus on at a more at a mm. kind of policy level rather than trying to give them, I don't know, smarties in the hope that they'll feel better. That'll be what I would say to people. Perfect answer. I think uh, that was an, uh, not in the list question, but uh, thank you so much for that answering. That's a good that. way to conclude the podcast, I see.